I was so uh, excited to see there in the chat. The first one that popped up was Chapel Hill, which is great. That's very close to me. I'm over in Asheville, North Carolina. So hello, Chapel Hill. And for all of you guys joining us today, I'm super excited to be chatting uh, today uh, during Sexual Assault Awareness Month um, and discussing the intersection of sexual assault and stalking and really uh, digging into the relevance of that. Why is it important to um, address these two issues and uh, delineate between them? Because oftentimes we see they kind of get categorized or lumped together when we are addressing these and responding to these. My name is Natalie Ivey. I work for the Stalking Prevention Awareness Resource Center. And I will say a little bit from my own experience, because it certainly colors um, probably the uh, way that I share information and discuss some of these topics but worked uh, primarily uh, or initially as a prosecutor prosecuting domestic and sexual violence in Tennessee for a little bit of time, um, just long enough to um, experience how difficult that job is and moved into the nonprofit world and worked in victim advocacy for an extended period of time with uh, victims of intimate partner violence, sexual violence, and human trafficking, and also had uh, some experience working in pretrial supervision here in North Carolina. So I've had an opportunity to see some different areas, specifically within our criminal legal system and our advocacy system, and we're going to talk about how all of those systems can play their part in recognizing and responding to stalking specifically, um, and certainly as it is co-occurring with sexual violence. So thank you guys for joining me today and being willing to kind of have this discussion. I know these topics can be heavy, um, can be tough. We certainly want you to take care of yourself as we are uh, digging into some of this content. Um, that's obviously our top priority. So do what you need to do as we uh, discuss some of this content and look at these forms of victimization. So the Stalking Prevention Awareness Resource Center, SPARC for short, we are funded by a federal grant to provide technical assistance and these types of trainings all over the country um, to folks who are doing the hard work. So for our law enforcement, our prosecutors, our victim advocates, anyone who is uh, in the field and is uh, working particularly with victims of stalking, but working um, in a way that can help support our system as a whole. We do this for free. So uh, not only does that mean that we are available to you to answer questions, we also are available to you to offer trainings. We do webinars, we do in-person trainings, um, and we can offer those at very low cost or free, depending on the circumstances or the logistics of those trainings, and we're always happy to do it. So I love hearing from folks. Um, if we talk about some things today and you sit and marinate on it for a while and some questions come up in a week or two, uh, maybe a month, uh, feel free to reach out and we can continue the conversation. That's one of my favorite things to do. The other side of this coin Though we are federally funded, um, you cannot hold the federal government um, responsible for our content today. This is Sparks content and my content uh, or my perspective from my own professional experience. Um, so though they provide us funding, this is uh, something that Spark is offering today and want to present to you. Uh, as I mentioned, we do this, this is what we do all day every day, is providing this type of training and support and ideally um, resources and guides that make your jobs easier if you are working in the field and if you're intersecting victims of stalking specifically. And most of these resources, if not all of them, uh, live on our website. This is uh, just kind of a treasure trove of resources, trainings, guides uh, that you can check out there. So you'll probably hear me reference it that quite a bit. Um, one of my colleagues, Emma, is on the call as well today too. Um, and Emma might be linking to some of the resources as we are chatting about them. But if there's something that we talk about and you wanna know where to find it, definitely check out our site. Um, and if you're looking for something, if you're in the field and you think, man, this would be really handy to have fill in the blank, and you don't see it on our site, let us know, because we're always developing uh, new resources and looking for ways to better support you. So we are always happy to hear that from folks who are doing the hard work. I would really encourage you to follow us as well on uh, your social media platform of, of choice. Uh, our handle is follow us legally. Um, our, our attempt at some humor there, right, and kind of a heavy field. But the way and the reason to follow us is uh, to stay up to date on the resources that we have available and the trainings. Hi, Natalie. Sorry. Yeah. Um, are you sharing slides? That would probably be helpful. We can't Look. see. <laughs> <laughs> Just one second. All Luckily. of that really great information. Yeah. Well, the good thing is you didn't miss much. <laughs> 
So here is our uh, federal funding information and here is our site and our resource guide. So you can go and follow uh, us on social media. Thank you, Mackenzie, for giving me a heads up. It's already been a week and it's only Tuesday. Um, so you can find what you need there and uh, let us know. You should have just let me keep going and everybody could have just been staring at me for the next hour and a half. That would have been a very entertaining uh, training for everyone. Okay, so why are we talking about stocking? What is the significance of stocking? And what does that look like um, kind of in the fields and the um, kind of arenas that we're working in? One of the reasons we want to emphasize the importance of talking about stocking and addressing stocking is because we see it so oftentimes getting kind of overlooked or um, added on in the end. We even kind of joke within our own office about um stalking being treated as as the uh, end of the sentence, right? We talk about, when we talk about gender-based violence uh, crimes, we talk about intimate partner violence, we talk about sexual assault, we talk about human trafficking, and stalking ends up being the main stalking, right? Just kind of gets lumped, lumped in there on the end. But the reality is, we know that stalking has the same um, impact, traumatic impact. Um, it can be indicators of lethality and danger, the response and the recognition of stalking is just as important as those other crimes that we oftentimes are focusing on within our system. So when we talk about stalking, we know that it's criminal, right? It's defined as a, as a criminal um, offense on the federal level in all 50 states and our territories and our most of our tribal codes and the Uniform Code of Military Justice. Now, if you are a legal nerd and you want to look up statutes, if you want to compare your statute to other jurisdictions, we have an interactive map that is super handy. You can go and click on uh, your area or whatever area you might be interested in, and it'll pull up those stalking statutes for you and other relative statutes as well. So it can be really helpful for you to take a look um, and to compare. And this can be helpful too, if we are assisting an individual who is wanting to access the criminal legal system, it's always helpful to kind of ground our, um, our advocacy and our support of them and what that criminal statute might be. We also know that stalking as a crime is traumatic, right? We know uh, this is a unique form of trauma that these victims experience because it is uh, extensive trauma over a, an extended period of time, right? This is a victimization that is not a one-time victimization. It is um, a, a multitude of um, actions against the victim. And we know statistically that oftentimes it can last for a year or more. So we see hypervigilance among the individuals who are experiencing stalking, stalking behaviors. And, you know, just as kind of quick little snapshots, we see truly kind of financial costs for victims of stalking. One out of eight end up losing time from work. They are literally losing money from uh, this victimization specifically. We also know that one out of seven stalking victims end up having to relocate. I think that statistic is really um, important for a couple reasons, one of which tells us the extent of the trauma, right? I don't know about any of y'all. Um, I've relocated, I don't know, it was almost about four years ago. I feel like I'm still recovering from that. You know, relocating, moving to a different uh, city, a different town, a different home, there's a lot that goes into that. It is tough work. It's physical work. It's logistical work. Finding new jobs is really, really difficult. And so to see that victims feel like this is the best avenue for them to promote their own safety and emotional well-being really gives, uh, gives us an indication of how extensive that trauma is. But the flip side, I think, to that uh, statistic, that data, is it's very telling about our systems, right? If one out of seven victims of stalking feel like moving is the best way to promote their own safety, that is telling um, that our systems are not providing the support and safety that they should be providing. So it's really a testament to the work that we need to do as stakeholders within our community to help improve that response. So obviously when we were talking about the experience of victims of stalking, we wanna ground that in what our survivors are telling us, right? And this is a quote from a survivor. It's not easy to describe the fear you have when you see the stalker or signs of the stalker everywhere you go. I have given up all hopes of ever having a safe life. For the rest of my life, I'll be looking over my shoulder, expecting to see him there. 
speaks to that level of vigilance that this victim is having to maintain. And really thinking through, I think it's so important for us to appreciate that vigilance doesn't end. There is no safe space for our victims of stalking. There's no time where they get to turn that off, where they get to relax uh, physically, emotionally, mentally. They are constantly on guard, right? They are constantly aware and looking around the corner to see if the offender is close by. And the level of ex exhaustion and trauma that comes from that is uh, certainly long lasting and has some, some some significant impacts. Unfortunately, we also know that stalking behaviors is an indication of uh, danger within that dynamic, within that victimization. So we see it oftentimes co-occurring with physical assault, sexual violence, which obviously we're going to be discussing today. We see the use of weapons when we see stalking behaviors. Um, close to one-fifth of stalkers are using weapons to threaten or harm their victims. And we see 76% uh, of femicides had stalking in the year prior. So oftentimes, if we are thinking about within an intimate partner um, relationship, if we see stalking behaviors, those can be indications that the escalation has already started, right? You know, if we are working in this field and we are trying to assess uh, lethality, if we're trying to assess risk to the folks, the victims that we're working with, stalking behaviors are behaviors we really need to be paying attention to. Uh, one of the researchers that we partner with very closely um, kind of summed up this experience, stalking is homicide in slow motion. And I think that speaks to that gravity, um, that fear, that terror that these victims are living with all the time. Uh, there is no respite from it. It is a constant um, emotion they are coping with and dealing with and trying to manage while also going about their everyday lives. So let's really kind of break down what stalking is, making sure that we have a universal uh, understanding and language for the ways that we describe stalking. Because as we'll talk about today, one of the reasons why our community does not recognize stalking or we fail to recognize stalking is because of misconceptions. We don't really have, as a society, a great general understanding of what stalking actually looks like. So when we define stalking, we kind of think about it in categories, right? There are legal and statutory definitions, which we already talked about a bit. Those criminal statutes can certainly define a criminal elements of stalking in your community. Um, if you are on a college campus, there might be uh, policies that define stalking behaviors on campus. So all of those kind of definitions might be uh, unique to where you are kind of logistically. And they all, unfortunately, as far as our criminal codes go, they differ just a bit from each other, right? A little bit unique. And so it is important. It's important to understand what those details are for your community specifically. But we also have this behavioral definition, which I think it's so important that we ground our conversation and our understanding of stalking in this behavioral definition to make sure, as we said earlier, to have kind of that universal understanding but also to know that we may be working with victims who are experiencing stalking behaviors who are not accessing the criminal legal system. Maybe the criminal legal system, the statutes don't come into play at all. And so it's really valuable for us as a support system, as uh, advocates, um, maybe just even as friends and family to understand what stalking actually looks like and to be able to help name that and help them identify that. So this is what we uh, talk about. This is the way that we define uh, this behavioral definition of stalking. So stalking is a pattern of behavior directed at a specific person. And I'm going to cut up this, this definition, just take little bites of it at a time to make sure that we have a really clear and broad understanding of what all this might entail. So first and foremost, pattern of behavior. We want to highlight that because this is unique to other forms of victimization that can occur from a one-time event, right? A sexual assault could be a one-time event. A physical assault could be a one-time event. A burglary. You know, there's other types of victimization that we look at that it's a singular incident that we are taking a look at. When we talk about stalking, we do have to identify that there are more than one events taking place. There's kind of this course of conduct is what our criminal statutes call it oftentimes. Now, this is important because it's unique, but also because this, this recognition of a pattern is oftentimes left to the victim to identify. 
our system doesn't have a great job of, or a great way of, of easily identifying a pattern of behavior. Um, and the, the, what I mean by that is uh, an individual experiencing stalking, um, they may be making reports and maybe making reports to people, you know, of authority, but this, the community doesn't have a way to put all of those dots together, right? So a, a, a victim of stalking may arrive to work late because of interference they were experiencing from the, their stalker. And they re may report that to their boss. I'm really sorry I'm late. Here's what's going on in my life. Um, I'm, you know, this is, I'm really struggling with this. It's difficult, right? The boss may or may not be understanding, but that was a report. That victim has reported that stalking behavior. And then maybe the victim uh, the next day on college campus comes out and sees the tires on the vehicle are slashed and calls campus police and campus police responds and they're dealing with that from a singular incident, right? Uh, damage of property. They're maybe not seeing the pattern, but again, the victim has reported it. And then maybe the third day, the victim talks to a parent or a friend or a family member and says, you know, this is going on in my life. It's getting out of control. I don't know what to do. So again, that victim has made a report, but none of those uh, individuals receiving that report are necessarily talking to each other or putting that picture together. So it becomes the responsibility of the victim to collect all of this information and to present this pattern of behavior. We want to try to reduce that lift when we can, and we'll talk about ways we can do that in just a bit. We also want to think about directed at a specific person, that contact component, right? Now, the offender might make direct in-person contact with the victim, but we also see offenders get incredibly creative about the ways that they contact their victim. So they might contact or make um, uh, an impact on their victim through third parties, through family members, through friends, through coworkers. You know, maybe the offender is just calling the victim's workplace and leaving messages with, um, you know, the person who handles the phones in the office. Has the offender ever talked to the victim directly? Not necessarily, but he's he or she or they are making an impact in that victim's life. So we want to think broadly about how this behavior can be impacting the victim's life, even if it is not direct in-person contact. Sometimes we get a little hung up in that logistics. Obviously, technology facilitates this, right? We know that technology has increased the ways that we can communicate with each other, that we can impact each other's lives. And so again, we want to think broadly about ways that that offender might be using technology to contact, to impact, to direct their actions to that victim, even if it is not a absolutely, you know, in-person one-on-one conversation. All right, so our, our next chunk here is directed at a spe specific person, that's what we just chatted about, that would cause a reasonable person to feel fear for the person's safety or the safety of others or suffer substantial emotional distress. So when we talk about reasonable person, that becomes really important because that's kind of a objective measurement, right? What, what reasonably could cause a person to feel fear? What reasonably could cause a person to suffer emotional distress? And the reason this is so significant, particularly with stalking, is that impact the fear, the, this emotional distress lies completely in context. So while other forms of victimization, let's say an assault, um, maybe somebody gets punched in the mouth, right? It's relatively easy from us, for us as outsiders, observers, to look at that action, the punch, and say, you know what, I think that might be criminal or it has the potential to be criminal, at least, right? We can identify that behavior and recognize the criminality behind it. With stalking, if we do not have context behind the behavior, it is incredibly difficult for outsiders to look at that behavior and suspect stalking, suspect that something criminal is happening. So if we don't have context, it's just somebody driving down the road, right? If we don't have context, it's just a phone call. It's just a text message. It's just a delivery of flowers. How could that be criminal? And so it's really, really important if we are working with a victim of stalking for us as support supporters, right, to help understand the context behind the actions, but also to help that victim articulate the context. Because again, this ends up 
in the victim's lab, talking or kind of becoming their responsibility to educate, whether it's law enforcement or advocates or judges or, or whoever they may be receiving services from, to educate them about context, that can be a really heavy lift. So it's important for us to understand the context behind the behaviors. So I wanna give just a quick example for how this context can get overlooked. But if you had a victim who was in an intimate partner um, relationship and it was a violent and abusive relationship and when the abuser got particularly violent, um, maybe they threatened to put white roses on the victim's grave when they killed the victim. I'm gonna kill you someday. And when I do, I'm gonna put white roses on your grave. I hope your mom likes white roses because that's what she's gonna see every time she comes to your grave. Pretty horrific, right? And maybe the victim has fled that relationship, has moved to a new uh, town, maybe a new state, thinks that they're living confidentially. They're, uh, you know, they have uh, escaped this abusive behavior and they show up for the first day of work and there's a dozen white roses on their desk. Everybody in that office is going to be having a reaction to those roses, right, for the most part. But anyone who has a reaction in that office is going to have a really positive reaction, right? There's no way that any of these new coworkers are going to see those roses and recognize it as a death threat. They're gonna be saying things like, oh my gosh, that's so lovely, this is beautiful, I wish somebody would do that for me. And the victim is going to be understanding very clearly that they have received a death threat, right? Their abuser has found them, knows where they are, and they are sending a very clear message to that victim. That's context. And we can see just in that example, this huge gap between our community, our society's response to some of these stalking behaviors and the victim's response to these stalking behaviors when we lack context. They can actually be on the opposite ends of the spectrum. So when we talk about fear for the person's safety or, sub or the substantial emotional distress, sometimes those can be difficult to articulate, to understand, um, it can be hard for a, a victim to even put words to their own emotions, their own expressions. It can be hard for support, support folks, whether it's advocates or prosecutors or law enforcement, to kind of draw that information out, right? That's really personal. It can be really, really difficult. But if we need that, we need to know that impact. It's important that we ask the right questions and in the right way. So just statistically... To give you an idea, when we are looking at individuals experiencing stalking behaviors, we're going to see 91% of female victims and 70% of male victims articulated that they did feel threatened, they felt fearful, they were concerned for their safety during that victimization. So we can take that statistic, that data, right? And if we are working with someone who's experiencing stalking, we can probably assume and I don't mean assume as in skip over the steps, but assume that there is underlying fear. We, we can use that to kind of um, be educated about the way that we provide our services, about the questions that we ask. We're not waiting necessarily for the victims to offer that up in a, you know, a very clear and articulate um, you know, declaration, but we're going in kind of informed and we want to ask the right questions. We want to be really intentional about the ways that we help them articulate that as well. Now, one thing that we want to keep in mind is that most of our stalking statutes include fear of sexual assault. That can be included as part of that fear of bodily injury, right? That's not a huge leap for us, but it's really nice to see that in our criminal statute, that that is a explicit uh, kind of carve out a, an explicit mention within our criminal statute. So keep that in mind as you are working with uh, victims, particularly if you're working with victims of sexual violence, um, if that is that violence is being used also within stalking behaviors. So we see kind of uh, the ways that this intersect, it happens a number of ways. These are kind of some of the most common, but we might see truly that fear of being, of experiencing sexual assault from the hands of the stalker we might see the stalker engaging in uh, that voyeurism, um, kind of invading privacy, using that intimate information that they might have. Um, the stalker might be targeting family, friends, loved ones. They might be using, again, that intimate information, whether they received it consensually during a relationship, um, if they received it non-consensually through their stalking behaviors. 
um, if they are creating material, right, with technology advancements today, and they're using that to continue to kind of um, exert that power and control over the victim. Now, one thing we want to point out really quickly, kind of a quick delineation between um, stalking that is incorporating or, or kind of co-occurring with the sexual violence and sexual harassment, those are, those are technically two different things. And sometimes those can get a little bit difficult to separate. Right. Um, so when we look at the definition of sexual sexual harassment, we're looking at repeated activity, right? Um, advances, requests. Um, we see um, a severity to that behavior. Um, it, it increases intensity. Uh, what the harassment is really kind of centering on is that the the end result, the impact of the behavior, is that the working environment has become hostile or offensive. That that is the end of the impact. When the impact starts to go into the field of fear, right? Fear of bodily injury, fear of sexual assault, fear or substantial emotional distress too. Then we start looking at it as a stalking behavior, right? We we start to to recognize that as a different crime in and of itself. Could they both be occurring? Yeah, I mean, certainly we could have sexual harassment starting and then that escalating into stalking and sexual violence. But something to keep in mind as we are talking about these terms and thinking about how those might present in our community. So let's talk about some commonalities between stalking and sexual assault, sexual violence in general. And one of the things that we see very commonly is this stranger danger misconception uh, when we are talking about offenders, offenders of um, sexual violence, offenders who are stalkers, our society as a whole still kind of uh, grounds itself in uh, this idea that it's going to be the scary guy lurking in an alleyway, right? This was just a really quick Google search uh, based on stalking. And this is what Google gave us. This is what Google Images showed us. Um, we've got hooded uh, offenders, almost always male um, some of them are even wearing masks, right? I don't know anybody who's been doing this work for long, if they've ever worked with an offender who uh, actually looks this stereotypical. Uh, we know the reality of that is kind of the opposite, right? We, we actually are much, much more likely to experience uh, victimization from someone that we know. But the impact of these misconceptions is that it uh, affects a victim's ability to even recognize that a crime has occurred or even if they recognize, hey, I don't like this, this is not great, they might be less likely, in fact, studies suggest that they are statistically less likely to report that behavior because they believe that it's not gonna be a crime, right? They believe that law enforcement or uh, whoever they might be reporting to has have the same perceptions of how this crime plays out. And so oftentimes when we're doing these trainings across the country, we talk about the way that stalking maybe is presenting or more oftenly not presenting, um, particularly in our criminal legal system. And one of our very first thresholds, the difficult things that we're facing is we're not hearing reports of stalking. That's why this education, um, you know, having you all on all on here on this webinar today, this is this is part of the solution, right? having community educations, community conversations, so that if an individual is experiencing this type of activity, this type of victimization, they feel empowered to recognize it as a crime and to report it as a crime so that we can respond in a way to, to truly address that victimization. We know that when the victim knows the offender, they're more likely to feel fear, but they are less likely to report to the police than those who are stalked by a stranger. Kind of hard to hold those two truths at the same time, right? But when we really start to dig into it, it makes sense. If you know who your offender is, and if you have been working in the field of victim advocacy for long, you probably have actually heard this from the victims that you're working with. Yeah, but I don't want him to lose his job. Yeah, but I don't want her to have to go to jail. I don't want him to lose custody of his kids. I don't want her to uh, suffer the consequences, right? When the victim has, particularly if the victim has a, an intimate relationship or had an intimate relationship or has a familial connection with that offender, they are very aware of the potential consequences that offender might face if the victim reports. 
So it's so important for us to make sure we are supporting that victim, right? Empowering them, helping them to make informed decisions, but we're also creating a, a space to offer services uh, that doesn't necessarily require um, those consequences to be felt. And I'm not at all advocating that there not be criminal legal consequences for uh, stalking offenders. Absolutely, there should be. But the first step to that is providing the victim with the support that they need to take that next step, right? We need to recognize this as a truth um, and understand it, right? To empathize with it and provide the support that we need to help them take that next step so that we can address this behavior and this victimization. And ultimately, ultimately, right, the goal is to provide healing and support for uh, the victim of crime. When we look at the statistics of stalking and sexual violence, we're going to see a pretty large overlap here because we're going to see the prevalence of these crimes to be fairly similar. We are going to see nearly one in three women and nearly one in six men would experience both of these types of crimes throughout their lifetime. Now, that doesn't mean that these individuals are experiencing both of these victimizations at the same time, but they might. They might be co-occurring as well. Um, but this is really important for us as we are assessing our systems and our community, because as I've already mentioned, oftentimes we are equipped and we are prepared to respond to victims of sexual violence. We might be naming that with some intentionality, and we might not be having the same amount of supports or communication or intentionality around victims of stalking, even though we know statistically it's happening just as often. It's something to think about when you think about your own services within your agency or your community and what that looks like for victims of stalking. So let's look at stalking and sexually violent behaviors. How do these kind of co-occur? What does this look like and how does this line up? The first thing we really wanna highlight is that sexual assault sur survivors, close to half of them experience stalking. So we see, and this is for our younger age population is what this study focused on specifically, but we do see a high level of co-occurrence when we have sexual assault, sexual violence, we see a high level of co-occurrence with stalking behaviors. When we talk about stalking behaviors in general, we talk about, um, we use kind of the SLI framework. This is from, again, one of the researchers that we, we partner with really closely. And the reason that we use this framework is to help kind of broaden our understanding of all of the behaviors that could, could be considered stalking. Um, kind of similar to our misconception, our visual misconception of that image, right? The stranger danger. Oftentimes when we're talking about stalking, we are talking or we have this misconception of um, maybe not even misconception. We have a narrow perception is probably a better way to say that of a stalker right, in the bushes with binoculars. Maybe we have this very stereotypical kind of um, surveillance type stalker, which obviously if somebody was doing that 100%, that would be stalking behavior. But that's not the only way that that presents, right? So we use these categories to help brainstorm and think through all the ways that these behaviors might present. And understanding too, some of these behaviors might overlap. This is truly kind of a Venn diagram. This is not a hard and fast list. Um, but just more of a, a way for us to think through stalking behaviors as a whole and help us to really identify all of the behaviors, not just those stereotypical surveillance ones. So when we talk about surveillance, obviously we are talking about kind of the watching, the following. Um, certainly with technology, this has become much more accessible to offenders to be able to track physical locations, um, to track uh, individuals or to collect information about individuals, uh, depending on a person's kind of digital presence that might make it easier to um, access some of that information. Um, but we see this in, um, you know, all of the ways that we can think of as far as kind of collecting, following, watching, um, uh, tracking someone. We know that it also can be proxy stalking when we're talking about surveillance particularly, which is essentially having a third party engage in that information collection. Tell me if you see the victim. Tell me if they show up there tonight. Tell me what, what they, where they are, what they're doing. Uh, I saw this horrible meme uh, going around on Instagram the other day where somebody was utilizing DoorDash to do that. They were ordering food from DoorDash and said, hey, I'm going to pay you for this delivery, talking to the DoorDash delivery driver. I don't want you to actually deliver the food. You can eat it. I just want you to tell me if there's a white truck in the driveway when you go by, right? 
that's proxy stalking. And so we see that kind of show up in a number of different ways. Our second category of stalking behavior is life invasion. So this is kind of intentionally inserting yourself into the victim's life. Now, this can be overtly um, kind of nefarious, right? If we're talking about public humiliation, if we're talking about kind of causing a scene, if we're talking about creating an issue for a victim at work, obviously we, we can see the impact of it almost right off the bat. But another thing, and we'll discuss this a little bit more when we talk about grooming techniques, this life invasion can actually be even more difficult to detect. It could be invading a victim's life in a way that appears to be very benign, in a way that appears to be very friendly. But the goal, the purpose of that invasion is to collect information, right? So they might be making that uh, connection, causing that invasion um, with the intention of really negative impact down the road. And so that's something to think about too. When we talk about stalking behaviors, the stalking behaviors in and of themselves don't have to have an immediate negative impact. If the purpose of the behavior, the invasion, is to create a, a, a negative impact of victimization later, that still qualifies as stalking behavior. So when we talk about these two categories and we talk about sexual violence, these are the ways that these might present, right? We see with surveillance, um, this might be collecting information, logistics, logistical information about a victim. Where are they going to be? When will they be alone? When will they be most vulnerable? Um, it might be collecting information about that person for purposes of blackmail. And we'll discuss this in a little bit more detail. We might see an offender um, using that surveillance to monitor a victim after a sexual assault has occurred. When we talk about life invasion, we see offenders, uh, as I mentioned, maybe creating that opportunity to connect with the victim, to, to build a, kind of a false trust with that victim, right? To, to collect information about potential emotional vulnerabilities that they might use to exploit later on. Uh, we might see a, a, an offender collecting intimate information, intimate pictures, intimate videos, using those to blackmail, to humiliate, to uh, ruin a person's social reputation, professional reputation. We see um, offenders impersonating victims on, particularly with, uh, within technology, on social media platforms, uh, in a way to interfere with their life and cause major uh, invasion on their privacy, and oftentimes, unfortunately, on their safety. So when we talk about this third category, interference, and this oftentimes kind of goes hand in hand with that invasion behaviors, those types of behaviors as well, but interference is disrupting, right? They are intentionally trying to create some level of disruption in that victim's life. So it might be in their employment, it might be socially, it might be within their relationships, uh, trying to ruin future relationships. Um, we might see truly um, kind of that physical sexual attacks uh, occurring to kind of complete that cycle of power and control. Uh, but we see that play out a number of different ways. And then our last category is intimidation. We might see, as I, I mentioned in a, an example earlier, maybe like slashing tires, that property damage, right? Trying to send a physical message, uh, trying to elicit that fear from their victims, um, particularly that symbolic violence. Uh, the other example I gave earlier about the dozen roses, that symbolic violence can be very common. What we see so oftentimes with stalkers is they engage in behaviors that they know will be difficult to detect. And so symbolic violence is incredibly effective, right? Sending flowers is really difficult to detect as a death threat. And so it's very effective for an offender to engage in symbolic violence because it's hard for our society to respond to it. It's easy for them to get away with it and they are able to elicit a really significant response from that victim. So again, with these categories in our sexual violence, we see with that interference, again, that's that sextortion, uh, sexploitation, um, using, and maybe not even with pictures or videos, and maybe it's with just rumors, right? Um, that can have a, a significant impact on a victim's life, particularly in smaller communities or for in a, a college campus, a high school setting, if there are um, kind of a, a tight-knit, close community, close social community that can have a really big impact. Um, we might even see 
interfering and damaging with um, birth control uh, against the victim's knowledge or against the victim's will, uh, that certainly can be a, a behavior that would qualify as sexual violence and as stalking behaviors. And intimidation, we see um, that symbolic violence, but sometimes the symbolic violence um, might have a sexual nature to it. So cutting up underwear, um, maybe something that in and of itself is very uh, revealing, uh, maybe is very embarrassing for the victim. We see the offender engaging in this um, specifically to elicit that intimidation and that fear in their victims. So in general, we kind of see these kind of common intersection points, right? Um, we might see a stalker who is engaging in those behaviors to plan the sexual assault, as we talked about earlier, maybe trying to figure out um, logistics. When will it be best, easiest to carry out that violence against the victim? Um, we might see the stalker engage in these behaviors to solicit someone else to assault the victim. So maybe the stalker has gained uh, intimate information, um, intimate knowledge about the victim and utilizes that to solicit this type of violence from third parties. Um, we see stalkers just engaging in sexual violence, as we've already talked about some of that data, but we see just an, an overlap there, right? Um, those can just be two of those tools of intimidation that that offender is using to exert that power and control over the victim. And then as we discussed a bit, we might see the stalker engage in these behaviors after a sexual assault has occurred in an attempt to maybe prevent the victim from reporting or maybe to continue to exert that power and control, um, using that as a means of um, kind, of, kind of keeping that victim from accessing support services. So let's talk about this stalking behaviors uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an attempt to commit sexual violence. This truly is grooming, right? This is what we've been discussing and labeling as grooming for an extended period of time, but it's that invasive approach um, inserting yourself into the victim's life to figure out, you know, uh, vulnerabilities, to gain trust, to learn more about the victim, and creating an opportunity for the offender to commit sexual violence. So it might be that the offender is truly researching and identifying vulnerable victims, maybe a category of victims, um, maybe they're basing uh, those vulnerabilities on uh, life circumstances, right? Um, maybe if an individual is experiencing homelessness, that that might increase their vulnerability. Um, if an individual is, um, you know, in the foster care system, if they are um, experiencing these other life circumstances that might create an opportunity of vulnerability that that offender wants to uh, try to take advantage of. We also see offenders making those contacts and those relationships again in a way that on the surface looks benign. They're they're trying to build trust. Um, and this might be from an authority figure, right? Hey, uh, you know, kind of talking with um maybe a younger person or somebody who is who is not in authority to start that relationship and to find out information about that victim. But it might also be just socially um, making a connection, trying to start a relationship. You know, if you are on campus and uh, maybe first day of college, uh, you're meeting new people and somebody asks for your phone number and you start texting and this person is very friendly and is inviting, to, inviting you to a party later that week, right? There's no real reason for us to look at that behavior and, and on the surface say, oh gosh, this is so criminal. But if we learn after the fact that the offender is inviting this victim to a party because the offender wants to commit sexual violence against the victim, then we see that that behavior, right? That interference and um, kind of the, the intentionality behind the behavior that makes it criminal. We might see the offender um, look to isolate that victim, again, just logistically, um, maybe using the blackmail sextortion, as we discussed already, um, or discussing uh, or uh, having a conversation with the victim after a sexual assault has occurred to try to reduce any potential consequences that the offender might uh, face. So obviously we know um, intimate image solicitation and exploitation uh, play kind of a huge um, part in these 
stalking behaviors and these sexual violence behaviors. So we might see a stalker obtain photos or videos consensually, right? Um, and in the moment, the victim may be under the impression that um, there is no nefarious motive behind uh, that conversation, but those are later used for very nefarious purposes, right? We might see they obtain those photos and videos non-consensually, maybe through um, technology, um, maybe through blackmail, uh, through force, coercion. And so they are using that and utilizing that to commit their sexual violence and to further their stalking behavior specifically. This is a case out of Knoxville, Tennessee, one of the towns I called home for a little period of time there. Um, but this was an individual who was doing just that. He was engaging in um, stalking behaviors to identify potential victims. He was doing that on Tinder, social media apps, um, and he would start to have these conversations and these online relationships. He was pretending to be a minor league baseball player, um, trying to lure in uh, these victims to enter into these relationships with him. So it started with, you know, giving him your phone number and those uh, communications kind of continued to devolve. And he oftentimes would threaten his victims to um, comply with his demands for sexual degrading images. Um, and he oftentimes then used that to further extort and to blackmail those individuals. So he was charged and successfully prosecuted in federal court there in Knoxville. But we see, unfortunately, this dynamic play out relatively regularly. We know that this is a common technique that a stalker might use in their um, attempts to control a victim or to elicit that fear of a victim. In fact, 16% of victims um, said that when they were being stalked, that that stalker shared nude, semi-nude, or sexually explicit, explicit photos of them. So again, this is from 18 to 24-year-olds. And we know that this is kind of a unique form of victimization. This can be really difficult for victims to disclose it can be really difficult for victims to receive support services for this type of victimization. We just wanna highlight these um, partners and uh, resources that are available to address this type of victimization specifically, because it is unique. It's a little bit different um, and can have its own complications um, and ramifications. And so these are really great resources that we have utilized um, and directed folks to in the past that can be helpful with that. So when we talk about that, we highlighted earlier the soliciting of a third party to commit sexual violence. And that stalker um, maybe has uh, discovered, has, has uh, used those behaviors to figure out really intimate um, information about a victim. And they are using that then to um, kind of expose that victim to further violence for, from other people. So unfortunately, the way that this might play out is um, either a stalker who through their stalking behaviors has gained this information, or maybe it's a former intimate partner who through the relationship has gained some intimate information and now is using that for really nefarious purposes. They might post that online uh, pretending impersonating uh, the victim, pretending to be the victim and requesting soliciting sexual violence, truly asking to be uh, sexually assaulted. And so this was a case out of Wyoming from a couple of years ago, um, which was pretty horrific. Uh, he pretended to be his ex-girlfriend um, and posted an ads on, ad on Craigslist. This was before Craigslist um, worked to, to change some of their posting requirements, but posted the, this information, gave very specific um, information about the victim, about the request, what what supposedly she would like to have uh, happen to her, um, gave very explicit information about where the victim lived, how to gain access to her house, um, and also encouraged the responders to the post um, not to be dissuaded by any protests that she might have, um, that uh, this was all part of the fantasy supposedly that this uh, victim had. And so um, unfortunately this occurred and had significant impact on the victim's life, but this individual was charged and received 60 years um, for this crime specifically. But this is the way that we might see that information being used specifically, the information that was gathered through the stalking behaviors then later be used 
uh, to complete sexual a sexual assault of the victim, even if it's not the offender themselves doing the sexual assault. So we talked a bit about sexual assault after, I mean, stalking behaviors after sexual assault, after sexual violence. And as we kind of already discussed, we see that play out a number of different ways. It might be um, uh, kind of a blackmail, right? You want to make sure you don't tell anybody. Don't forget, I've got those pictures. I've got those videos. It might be continued grooming depending on um, the nature of the criminal behavior. Uh, hey, that was a really great time. I think you had a lot of fun, right? If they were trying really hard to uh, groom this victim for further sexual violence, um, it might just be hostile, right? Uh, the threatening, if you tell someone I'm gonna hurt you, I'm gonna hurt your family, I'm gonna hurt your friends. Uh, but we see that stalking behavior can occur after sexual violence, particularly. So all of these things are things that we want to think about, particularly if we are working with a victim of sexual violence. These are kind of um, touch points that we want to be asking questions about to, to really determine are stalking behaviors occurring at the same time as, as a sexual violence event, as, you know, in conjunction with the sexual violence that this victim experienced. And we'll talk a little bit why it's important to name. Sometimes that feels overly traumatizing, right? Why does it matter? Why does it matter to really um, kind of collect all of this information and to parcel out these two forms of victimization? But there is truly value, and particularly as a advocate, as law enforcement, as a prosecutor, in uniquely identifying each of these criminal behaviors because it affects the care and the support that we offer to that victim, because it's going to tell us statistically um, the likelihood of danger, of lethality that that victim might be facing. It also allows us to respond and address that stalking behavior specifically, ideally within that criminal legal system, right? So that we can uh, start to have a long-term impact and make a difference in this behavior having true legal consequences for this behavior outside of the consequences for the sexual violence as well. So one thing to keep in mind when we are talking about charging, um, if we're looking within the criminal, criminal legal system, charging sexual violence and charging stalking, other types of relevant charges we might want to keep in mind if we're not able to uh, kind of check the boxes for some of these other statutory crimes. But we might want to look at voyeurism. We might want to look at um, many of our states, our jurisdictions have uh, statutes relative to um, the creation, the unlawful creation of an image, of an intimate image of another, the non-consensual distribution of intimate images. Many, many of our jurisdictions have statutes against that, and hopefully more will continue to join. Uh, we obviously are going to consider that sexual assault, the indecent exposure, any of those kind of relevant charges that could be related to the sexual violence particularly as well. All things that we might want to consider, right, as we are looking at potential charging um, uh, approaches to that criminal behavior. Okay, so let's take a look at sexual assault and uh, intimate partner violence and stalking when we have all of these occurring at the same time. So one thing to think about statistically, we oftentimes are thinking about stalking behaviors occurring once a relationship ends, right? Bad breakup, now the, the uh, intimate partner is engaging in stalking. I can almost guarantee you if that partner is abusive after the, the relationship, they were probably abusive during the relationship, right? This, this is probably not a new dynamic that they're picking up. We just don't recognize it that way because we are oftentimes used to labeling that abuse within the relationship as intimate partner violence, which it absolutely is. But it also could be stalking. We see statistically, you know, after the relationship ends makes up about 43%, but during and during and after, uh, we're going to see those stalking behaviors co-occurring pretty regularly. And one of the things we kind of think about when we think about intimate partner violence is walking through kind of our, our traditional way of identifying and defining intimate partner violence. Obviously, this power and control wheel is a super powerful model and helpful resource as we think through all of the ways that intimate partner violence can present. But as we are looking at this power and control wheel, which I will 100% uh, uh, fess up to. I, I did this work for a very long time and worked in this field, and I very rarely looked at this power control wheel with a stalking lens on, right? Now, did I identify stalking behaviors in uh, the cases that I was working? Absolutely. Was I calling it stalking? No. 
I was saying, you know, this, this individual is incredibly abusive, man, they're incredibly controlling, right? I was using terms within this power and control dynamic, but I was not uniquely identifying it as stalking. But when we look at each of these categories and we think about those stalking behaviors in general, we can see the overlap right off the bat, right? The coercion and threats, the isolation. Isolation for me uh, is particularly relevant. I, I did a lot of my work in really rural communities, and I always tell a story um, at the cost of dating myself. But um, when I first started doing this work, I was working with victims who um, were experiencing this physical isolation, right? They, they truly lived in really, really remote areas, and they would report to me. They would say, you know, when my abuser leaves for work, they check the odometer on my vehicle. And when they get back from work, they check the odometer again and they make sure the vehicle was not driven. It was not, not used, right? That odometer was just a really easy way for that abuser to track the victim's location because they knew there wasn't anything. There were no support systems. There was no way to call for help. There was no um, no other connection that victim might access on foot. They were going to require a, a vehicle to get from their home to um, a place of help. So, you know, I, I, again, I, I can think about many cases. I worked with that dynamic and recognized that as incredibly abusive. I didn't realize that was stalking, right? That that was a way that that abusive uh, individual was surveying the victim without having to physically watch the victim the entire time. They were carrying out that stalking behavior. So when we see the intimate partner co-victimizations, we see that women who are stalked by their partners, they experience psychological abuse, physical abuse, sexual abuse, and injury at significantly higher rates. So again, the importance, the value, and naming stalking uniquely allows us to better uh, support and particularly to better safety plan for the victims that we're working with. Because we're going to see that stalking behavior are, um, those behaviors are, are really clear indicators of lethality or risk to that victim. We know that 31% of women who were stalked by an intimate partner were also sexually assaulted by that intimate partner. So, you know, kind of my extrapolation from a lot of the data that we look at is these abusive individuals who are engaging in intimate partner violence or sexual violence, when we see that stalking occurring, we see a level of, um, Kind of audacity or persistence, right? That this is an uh, this is an abuser who will not be dissuaded. This is an abuser who is not discouraged by law enforcement response, by court response. Uh, these are the abusers that are the most dangerous in our system, right? They're the ones that we are uh, uniquely paying attention to to try to prevent uh, any type of future homicide within that relationship. This is another statistic that speaks to that women who are stalked by a violent partner after obtaining a protective order were almost 10 times more likely to experience sexual assault than women with protective orders who are not stalked. So goes back to uh, the value of naming that stalking behavior when it's occurring within a, di within a dynamic, making sure that we are aware of that. Uh, whether we are advocates, law enforcement, prosecutors, or just a support system for individuals who are experiencing these behaviors, we're recognizing that stalking behavior as an indicator of severity and gravity and something we need to be paying attention to. Now, another um, common kind of um, gender-based violence uh, crime that we might be addressing with our system is trafficking. You know, and oftentimes, we silo trafficking as its own form of victimization, which it absolutely is, right? But we also know that trafficking can co-occur with all of the crimes that we've discussed today. It can be from an intimate partner. Um, it obviously is going to, or not obviously, but oftentimes if we have sexual traffic or yes, sex trafficking, we are going to have that sexual violence component, right? Um, but we're also going to see traffickers engage in stalking behavior. I spent quite a few years working with uh, victims of human trafficking in East Tennessee, and I will say, looking back on cases um, that our agency uh, worked with and uh, clients that we supported, can't think of a single trafficker who did not engage in stalking behavior. So we see a very big overlap with traffickers and human trafficking and stalking behaviors as a whole. We know that 
a trafficker is going to utilize within that surveillance component, right? That category behaviors, they're going to be monitoring that victim. They're going to keep eyes on that victim. Um, oftentimes our traffickers are seeing their victims as a commodity, right? Sometimes they're most valuable commodity. That's what's making them the most money. And so they are very intentional about the way that they control that, that individual's location, um, where they are, and also if they are meeting the quota, the expectation of the trafficker certainly plays into that surveillance behavior. Um, we also see life invasion, right? We know that um, traffickers insert themselves into victims' lives. That's a common technique. And again, it might start in a benign way. It might start in a romantic way. It might start in a really positive way. Oftentimes I would hear um, from clients that the trafficker was the only one who fed them, the only one who gave them a roof over their head. Uh, they were meeting some type of vulnerability. They were meeting some type of need that that victim had. And so that trafficker, though that, that invasion on the front end looked positive, right? The intention behind it was to create a vulnerability, a dependency on the trafficker as a whole. And so we see that certainly occurring pretty regularly and falling into that category of stalking behaviors. We know that interference um, co-occurs as well for uh, individuals who have experienced trafficking. We know if they are trying to break out of that cycle, right, if they're trying to escape that victimization, the trafficker oftentimes will be utilizing um, videos, pictures, evidence, rumors, uh, they are going to work really hard to ruin that victim's life, to make it really, really painful for that victim to try to leave or um, find support from someone else. So certainly falls within that interference category and those stalking behaviors. And then finally, we know that trafficking can be a very violent crime as well. And so we see the intimidation factor um, pretty high, pretty significant, right? Those victims of trafficking witness and experience some pretty horrific physical and sexual violence oftentimes. And so the threat of that is very real and very effective and certainly see the co-occurring of stalking, the intimidation category within that trafficking cycle as well. So back to naming it, we wanna make sure that we are charging it that we are prosecuting stalking when we can so that we are addressing this behavior as a whole. And, you know, one thing that I always kind of come back to, because for me, uh, certainly within my own professional journey and my own kind of passion, what drives me is justice, right? It's really hard for me to just tolerate injustice, just knowing that there is uh, um, this injustice within our society. And what really irritates me when we look at the cycle of stalking is stalkers kind of uniquely think they're smarter than the system and they can engage in these behaviors in ways that's going to make it very difficult for our system to detect and essentially they'll be able to get away with it, right? And the unfortunate part of that is that's held true for a lot of stalkers. Um, it continues to hold true in a lot of communities. We really have to work to change the tides so that these individuals actually feel consequences and repercussions for this very offensive and violent behavior that they're engaging in. And as we already mentioned, safety planning, we want to make sure that we're considering the risks when we are working with victims and victim empowerment. You know, the value and the power of naming something, giving an experience a name, and a response, even if we don't change that victim's reality, can have a really positive impact on that victim. So when we talk about working with victims of stalking, we wanna make sure that we are being really intentional about the impact that this trauma maybe has had on them and the way that that trauma presents. What I mean by that is when we have a victim of stalking who has had an extensive um, traumatic episode with their offender, it might be really difficult for them to articulate the impact that that behavior has had on them. It might be really difficult for them to report the behavior and say, this is making me fear, feel fearful. This is making, this is causing me substantial emotional distress, right? What happens is that trauma might present in a lot of different ways and in ways that maybe from the outside is hard for us to understand. So we might see victims of stalking present as angry, right? Um, 
oftentimes anger is the safest emotion that we as humans can have. That's the, the emotion that can feel the most comfortable to some degree. And so we might have a victim who um, presents and is just mad at the world, is mad at you for trying to help, is mad at, you know, all of the people who, who are kind of providing support or surrounding them in their lives. We want to be really intentional about digging through that anger and understanding the source of that anger, because that anger can cause those victims to be dismissed by our system really quickly. Oftentimes, particularly with our criminal legal system, we want our victims to be uh, very meek and mild and grateful for help, right? Um, and to be honest and open about how scared they are and the impact that this crime has had on them. That's kind of the ideal picture that our system as a whole has. But that's not how human nature works. And so if we as advocates or as support folks for victims of stalking, if we don't help dig through that anger, we're going to have victims who are dismissed by the system, who are overlooked or kind of turned away. She's not a real victim. He's not a real victim. They're not a real victim. They're they're angry. They're rude, right? They, they came in here and cussed me out. So we want to be very intentional about that. We also want to think through um, the reactions that we hear from folks if we are asking them about the impact uh, that this stalking behavior has had on them. Now, I think about uh, an individual who was reporting um, some stalking behavior to me uh, prior to my role here when I was working as an advocate. And this is an individual I happen to know really well. They they were talking to me because of my professional role, but they were calling me because of our, our personal connection, right? This is someone I, I really knew well. And uh, they were describing what they were experiencing. And that was pretty concerning. And I made the mistake of saying like, oh man, that sounds really scary, right? And this happened to be an older gentleman that I was talking to, and his response really quickly was, it's, I'm not scared. It's isn't scary. But then he followed that sentence with, I'll just tell you, if this guy shows back up again, I'm going to shoot him. Right? It kind of caught me off guard when I heard that. And then I realized what I had done. I had made him feel uncomfortable, right? I, I was putting emotions on him that he was not comfortable articulating. And what he was telling me was, I, I don't want to admit that I'm scared, but I'm also going to tell you in the same breath, I'm preparing to take um, pretty serious action, right? I'm preparing to take another person's life. That, that's how much this has impacted me. Now, he wasn't in a place where he could unpack that. But for me, with my training and my experience, that's on me to understand what he's articulating to me, right? It's, it's on me to unpack that and to really understand this is an impact that this is having on this person's life. So I say that to kind of charge you with that responsibility. When we have victims who are presenting in a way that, you know, if I had taken him on the surface, if I had just listened to what he said, I would have said, oh gosh, well, yeah, well, he seems fine, right? He, he's 100% uh, prepared to defend himself. If I didn't unpack that, I really wouldn't have understood exactly how horrible this experience had been for him. And so we want to be really, really intentional about what we're asking, how we're asking it, and the way that we're listening to people. Another way that we can kind of get to that uh, impact, if it's hard for us to ask about it on the surface, if the victim is not in a place to really disclose the impact on the surface, is oftentimes we can talk about accommodations, right? Well, what have you done in your life? I mean, this individual offered up. He was preparing. He was preparing a, a firearm. That was the way he was preparing to defend himself. You may not always hear that, that extremely. Um, but you might hear a victim say, no, I'm not scared. Well, have you done anything differently since this behavior started? Well, yeah, I mean, I don't take the city bus anymore. And I stopped working night shifts. And I got a new phone number. And I, you know, I, I bought some security cameras. But I mean, I'm not scared, right? And that's okay. It's okay for them to be in that space and to articulate those emotions in that way. But we can listen critically to those accommodations and we can extrapolate from that. It is having an impact on this victim's life. And it's important that we document that for them, that we help them um, kind of identify those accommodations, identify the impact. All right, we don't have to call it scared, but we can say that you've changed your work schedules, right? We can say that you've increased your 
your security at your house. We can say that it's it's caused you to uh, change your travel routes. So being willing and able to listen critically and help a victim document that is a really important part of supporting victims of stalking uh, specifically. Another uh, way that a victim might cope with this type of crime is moving towards the offender, right? Um, very often as a prosecutor, there would be times in court where uh, a defense attorney might come in feeling pretty excited and say, well, you don't have a case because your victim called my client last night, right? And that was kind of seen as a, oh, all right, well, we've just lost it, right? This, this has blown our whole case. How can we possibly prove this victim was scared if the victim is making contact with the offender, what I wish I knew then that I know now is that is really a very common way for a victim to manage their own safety. And it's really important that we as advocates or attorneys or law enforcement officers be informed about that, that we recognize that when that's what's happening and we help educate the other partners in our community. So I, I kind of always associate it with this this kind of um, story I heard, because I, I think it really articulates how society views this versus how the victim views this. But I heard a, a story where an individual was going free diving with sharks. I know that doesn't make any sense, but this is what they were doing on their vacation. And so as they were preparing to free dive with sharks, um, the uh, individual who was taking them out there, right, the, the specialist was saying, this is really important to remember. When Once you get in the water, the safest thing for you to do is to main, maintain eye contact with the shark. That is the safest thing. If you are maintaining eye contact with the shark, it is very unlikely that that shark will, will attack. The most dangerous thing you could do is swim away, is to splash, is to call for help, is to move away from the shark. That's really the most dangerous thing. And when I heard that story, I thought that's so illustrative of the way our society views victims versus their reality. The reality is oftentimes for victims, particularly if they have managed this offender's violence, if they have managed this offender's um, power and control swings, that victim might be very skilled at reading the offender and knowing how safe they are, right? Being able to assess their safety based on the offender's mood, based on the offender's communication, even just based on the offender's location. That victim might know the safest thing to do is to look that shark in the eye. We as a society look at it and we say, ah, you're in the water with a shark, swim, swim, swim. If you're not swimming, you must not be scared, right? But we don't have the knowledge that the victim has, which is the safest thing to do is to maintain that eye contact and to understand what's happening within that offender's life. So that's not always the case, but it's always really important to consider that very well could be the case. And we want to help that victim unpack that, to articulate that, right? To explain that, why they might be making contact with the offender and how that potentially could be an indication of violence within that uh, dynamic. It could be an indication of lethality or even an indication of the gravity of that victim's experience. So those are all just things to be thinking about as we are looking at particularly the way a victim of stalking might present and how that trauma might be affecting them. Ultimately, we do want to advise disengagement from the offender. That's the ideal response, right? Because we know that that offender is fueling themselves on a reaction from the victim. That is, that is really their whole goal, right? Is to see the fear, to see the control that they have over that victim. So ideally, we want to insulate that victim from the effects of that victimization. But we also recognize that the victim is the expert in their own safety. And so we want to make sure we are kind of grounding that advice and grounding our guidance and our support of that victim based on their own expertise, their own experience with that victim. And again, helping them articulate that. So if we're making phone calls, if we're making contact, even if the contact seems friendly, we called and chatted last night for 30 minutes. Why did we feel like we needed to do that? What purpose did it serve? Well, it made me feel better because I knew that, you know, um, they were home. And if they're home, that means they're not out. And if they're not out, that means I don't have to worry about them showing up at my house, you know? 
that can be a, a real source of comfort to a victim, which is understandable. But we want to help kind of dig through that, unpack it, and help them articulate that as well. So ideally, when we are working with victims of stalking, we want to help promote their safety. Um, and we have tips online about assisting victims of stalking and safety planning specifically. You know, I would encourage you to review those. I think safety planning can be incredibly vital and incredibly valuable, but I also have great respect for safety planning, right? That we don't ever want to be dipping our toes into an area that um, could contribute to lack of safety for a victim. And really what I mean by that is if we are safety planning with a victim, that we're doing it with a great intentionality, that we're never uh, kind of over-promising to that victim, hey, now you've got the safety plan in place. You can, you no longer have to be vigilant. Uh, you are absolutely safe now. Uh, we can never make that promise. Um, and we want to be really intentional about the ways that we're helping promote their safety, but we're not promising their safety. Um, but there are some tips and, and um, some guides to that on our site. If that is uh, within your purview and your professional uh, capacity to provide that for victims of stalking, we want to provide advocacy for victims of stalking, no matter what uh, role you might hold within your own community. Maybe something you've learned today, something that you know about stalking, whether it's about trauma, the effects of it, but helping educate our community partners educating our community as a whole uh, can be really, really valuable. Um, and thinking about that, that community education, there's a high likelihood if you are doing some type of community education, you're gonna have victims of stalking in the audience. And so just providing that level of education, giving it a name and a definition and helping them understand this victimization can allow them and empower them to report that victimization and to respond to it as it should be. We want to encourage them to document. I'm going to give you a resource here in just a second and talk about that. And ultimately, we want to provide support, right? I'd really encourage you, if you work in a victim service agency, if you work in a field that provides resources to victims of crime, look through your agency's uh, communication, whether it's your social media, maybe your website, maybe what pops up on Google in your community. If there is a victim of stalking in your community, uh, do they know that they can access resources from you? Do they know that you provide services to them? Is it easy for them to know where to turn and to find that support within their own community so that they are accessing your services regularly? So when we talk about documenting um, stalking behaviors, I, I kind of alluded to this at the beginning of the training, but so often we are requiring the victim of the crime to carry the weight of the investigation victim, you have to show us the pattern. You have to you have to document all of these things. You have to be able to articulate how it's impacting you. It just is a lot to ask. It can be unreasonable for an individual who is in the middle of a traumatic event. But one of the things we really want to encourage, particularly if we are talking to someone who is experiencing stalking behaviors, we do want them to document to help us better support them. But we want to give guidance on what to document, right? So often we hear from victims who say, you know, I was told to document, just told to write it down. What does that mean? Is that a dear diary journal? Every time something happens, does it mean I'm calling 911? Every time I get a text message, it can be really difficult and really hard to understand. So this is a incident and behavior log. We have this on our site. You can check it out, download it um, uh, and use it if it's helpful for you or for those that you work with but it just kind of narrows the focus so that victim of stalking can really collect the relative information, right? This is the information that we need. Um, it also keeps that focus a little bit narrow so we're not collecting information that we don't need. What I mean by that is if we're asking a victim to document and we're not giving any guidance, it might be that the victim documents how that behavior made them feel this was really terrifying. Understandably so, right? They, they are documenting their experience. We really don't want that to be in an official record, particularly if it, there is a criminal legal case that comes out of this victimization. Because worst case scenario, that ends up as part of the case and becomes part uh, entitled to discovery and ends up in the offender's hand. And then the offender is able to see exactly what behaviors were the most terrorizing and the most traumatic to the victim. So that could really end up working against the victim in a lot of ways. We really encourage our um, 
our advocates and our support folks as we are uh, talking to victims of stalking and, and, you know, our professionals in the field are encouraging documentation to give direction. What do we, what do we want documented and how do we want documented? Another point I will give to this log, or if you are giving instructions on what to document as an advocate, this might be really helpful to you. If you are looking at um, a victim's experience, oftentimes when we're working with the general public, understandably, a badge is a badge, right? I called the police, they're all police or they're all cops and they're all on the same team. But we as advocates in our community might know the deputies are a very different team than the police officers in the city who are a very different team than the campus police officers. And so if we look at this log and we see that the victim has made reports, but they're to these entities that don't necessarily communicate regularly, we as an advocate can help connect those pieces of the puzzle, right? The victim might think, well, they're all talking to each other and they haven't done anything. So I'll just interpret that as there's nothing to be done. But we might be able to look at that and say, oh, let me make a phone call. Let me help connect these dots and make sure we're all talking and having a conversation about what's going on here. Okay, so at the beginning of this training, I said, ultimately our goal is to make your job easier. And that truly is why we are here. So on our site, you can find resources for you. If you are a community member who wants to address or have conversations about stalking, we have fact sheets. Uh, we have ways to um, approach community educations. We um, are have lots of resources that talk about the intersection of stalking and sexual violence, much of what we've talked about today. So you can check that out. We also have a lot of professional resources. If you happen to be in the field, whether it's law enforcement or advocate, you can go and take a look. Uh, we have guides, we have checklists. Um, ideally, we want to reduce the load for you because we have great respect for the work that you're doing and we wanna make your job easier and help increase the efficacy of the support that you're providing. So take a look, you can check all of that out. It's all on our site. As I mentioned earlier too, we have our webinars up there as well. If there's something you're looking for and you don't see it, please reach out and let us know. We're always happy to continue to refine and develop our uh, to develop our resources to make them as most effective and helpful as possible. So we love to hear from you. And please feel free to reach out to me directly. I'm happy to answer any questions um, or talk through any cases with you. If you're working something with uh, has a particular difficulty or struggle, uh, we're happy to brainstorm and uh, plug you into any other resources that we might have. I think we've got just a little bit of time, and I don't know if we have any outstanding questions that haven't been answered, but I'm happy to answer those now. Or if anybody has any questions, throw them up there in the Q&A, and we will try to take care of these before the uh, end of this training. So it looks like, okay, I see a couple. Um, All right, so I'm looking at this first um, anonymous comment about um, it looks like kind of stalking behaviors that's being that are being dismissed by um, maybe professionals in the system. I can't do much if the stalker hasn't done anything. Um, how do you deal with this? How do you fix it? And not only in prevention, but in the moments when stalking is not taken seriously in certain cases. That's a great question. And I wish I had a, a perfect answer for you or a perfect cure. I think so much of that is that community coordination. I would, I think in the moment, if we have an individual who's experiencing stalking behaviors and there's no response, no response from law enforcement, no response from our system, going back to those statutes and taking a look at the statutes, like I said, you can find them on our site. You can see what the elements of stalking are. It's a course of conduct, that's two or more events, right, that causes this effect on a person. And you can take the information from your own advocacy and plug it into those elements. Course of conduct, well, this happened on these days, right? We've got three events. Uh, directed at a specific person, we can check that box. And here's the impact. I'll tell you uh, the accommodations the victim has made in their life and the effect that it's had on this victim's life. So kind of matching up the information that you have from that victim with that criminal statute, and then having a conversation with an officer, ideally uh, somebody who is supportive of you in the work that you do, but I, you know, at the end of the day, anybody who is in the law enforcement role and just get some clarification from them. 
why these two things are not lining up, why, what, what the gaps are that they see. And it might be informative. Maybe they say, oh, we're missing this element. We, we have to show X, Y, and Z. You might have that information in your hat, right? From your advocacy. Oh yeah, well that has happened. Here, I, we can document that. It might be something to give you kind of direction in your advocacy with that victim. Um, but but the, you know, that that is a conversation that we could probably have for hours. And I will tell the person who ever asked that, if you want to email me, I'm happy to jump on a phone call with you and we can brainstorm ideas because there's just a lot of ways to take bites of that apple. But in general, that's kind of where I start is having that preliminary conversation truly with that criminal code statute, with the information that you know about the victimization and seeing what what is the breakdown here? Why are we not lining up? Uh, where are we not seeing the same thing? Um, because very few, if any, I, can't, I hate to say definitively, uh, but I feel like at this point I've read all of the criminal code statutes in the United States uh, relative to stalking, require actual physical assault, right? They they almost all are looking at impact, that they're call, call, creating that fear, creating substantial emotional distress, so you can really kind of hone in on what that statute says and compare that with the information that you know from the person that you're working with. Uh, someone asked about more common stalking through social media or physical stalking. Um, we know, I, I don't know that I can say more common. I, we know that I think it's close to 75% of individuals who experience physical stalking also experience in-person stalking. Um, I don't know that there has been a lot of studies done on prevalence as a whole, but we do know that technology is facilitating stalking behaviors, making it much, much easier to engage um, in stalking behaviors. So, you know, I think if, if we had the resources and the ability to hone in on that and study that specifically, we might see that number be much higher. Um, yes. So somebody mentioned the value of um, connecting victims with support services in the community 100%. I think that was Mark. I totally agree with you. Uh, as a former prosecutor, I obviously always want to see um, justice done in the criminal legal system, but sometimes that's not an option. And sometimes that's not the most holistic thing for the victim. So we do want to keep that in mind. What resources are available for that victim? That is the ultimate goal is providing resources and support for that victim. I totally agree with you. Um. So somebody talks about kind of how do we um, kind of document the accommodations a victim has made in their life without disclosing safety measures? That's a really great question. I think part of that might be um, a conversation in general with your prosecutor outside of any individual case. Um, but to kind of work through what it is that prosecutor is looking for, um, and then maybe thinking through ways that we can generalize that, right? So if the prosecutor's saying like, all I care about, I know you mentioned um, a firearm, you know, and, and certainly that's significant, but if, if the prosecutor's kind of looking for these big benchmark things, are they um, increasing their personal security? Are they, you know, changing their routine? Maybe you can look for those general categories and be able to articulate to the prosecutor, hey, these things have happened without going into specifics about exactly how the victim is promoting their safety within those categories. That's not a super specific answer for you, but that probably does require a longer conversation. Again, feel free to reach out to me and we can jump on a phone call and discuss, but that's a really great question, something to be really, really intentional about, Important of, importance of having those conversations on the front end. The log, yeah, that's great for the victim to fill out. Advocate can help fill out um, uh, on the front end or, uh, you know, on back end if they are providing um, kind of helping document what, what has already happened. But ideally, that's something that a victim could take with them and fill out in the moment. And Kayla, I think I answered your question about the emotion on the log. Um, how can we be more aware and alert to the ways that being from a different culture than our own or from a marginalized group in general impact the understanding of the context of stalking? Yeah. Great question, Karen. I think there's so much um, intentionality behind that question is context is not just relative to a relationship. It's relative to an individual. It's relative to a culture. It's relative to a community. And so I think to me, my general answer to that is just education, education, education. The more that we can learn about those other cultures, 
uh, learn about the significance of those things that you mentioned, the more that we can better articulate that and educate our community partners. Um, but if you have a specific question about that, that's a really great question. Please feel free to reach out and we can brainstorm about ways that we could do that with specificity. But so much of that is um, educating ourselves and equipping ourselves to educate others, right? As advocates, we are community educators every single day. Um, okay, so Joanne is talking about law enforcement, uh, the response of not being able to do anything until something happens. I think, uh, kind of back to my answer earlier, is trying to take a look at your um, criminal statute and your jurisdiction and maybe sharing that. If you, you said you're a self-defense teacher for your students, sharing that for the folks who maybe are experiencing those behaviors, and join if you guys have questions about those statutes, if they feel hard to digest, shoot me an email. Let's have a phone call. We can talk about it. We can dig through that. We can understand what the important parts of those statutes are so you can empower your students to access law enforcement in a way that's hopefully helpful for them. Um, someone was asking about the presentation that focuses on minors who are victims of stalking or sexual violence. Our scope um, only kind of, it kind of ends at that young adult age group. Um, we, our scope doesn't include minors specifically, um, but if you want to reach out to me, I might be able to find some outside resources that can give you some guidance on that. But Spark as a whole does not provide uh, training or technical assistance for the minor population as a whole. Um, Okay, so what is the best way to navigate encouraging someone to report activity or get help without making you feel like they're responding incorrectly? I found it frustrated with people telling me I should have done X, Y, or Z. Absolutely. Yeah, I think there's so much intentionality in the way that we communicate with victims of crime. Um, even asking about accommodations. What have you done since this crime has occurred? That can sound accusatory, right? Uh, for me and my own experience, and I'm not a social worker, so I am not an expert in providing trauma-informed care, but I've been trained in trauma-informed care, and I try to follow trauma-informed responses. What works for me is just being as, um, as kind of transparent as possible as an advocate or as a supporter. Hey, I want to ask you some questions about things that you've done, not as any type of judgment. This just helps me to understand you know, ways that this this crime has impacted you. But I also understand there's no right way to respond. You know, just putting all that out there, having that conversation on the front end. Why am I asking these questions? What is the purpose behind these questions? And I think sometimes that can help mitigate the impression that that gives to victims of crime. But I totally agree with you. We want to be really, really intentional about the way that we ask those questions. Um, so, so often stalking is focused on stalking by someone of the opposite sex. It might be important to give examples of stalking between same sex. One example would be when a guy stalks and threatens another guy because of an ex-girlfriend situation. Yeah, absolutely, Karen. Um, and oftentimes in some of our uh, broader trainings, this one had a specific focus relative to sexual violence. Uh, so I wasn't able to include all of the content that we have because you guys would have been here all day. Um, but in some of our broader um, trainings, we do talk about the dynamic st statistics of um, those that exact scenario that you're talking about. When um, uh, we are looking at genders, when we're looking at relationships, when we're looking at um, all of the ways that that might play out, but that dynamic that you just highlighted of an, indi an individual stalking a, a former intimate partner and that intimate partner starts a new relationship, we do see that stalking behavior then extend to the new partner. So, um, and that can create its own kind of complications and our society recognizing that uh, it comes with its own biases and own difficulties. So you're absolutely right, Karen. Um, that is certainly a topic and a training for another day. So you can jump on the site and we can set that up. I'll be happy to discuss that, but it's a very good point, very valid. Unfortunately, we just can't include everything in an hour and a half as much as I would love to do it. Those are great questions. Thank you guys so much. And I'm happy to hang on. I know we're over time at this point, but if anybody else has any other questions and Mackenzie, I, I don't want to um, overpromise on your part. You have been so gracious in hosting us. So whatever we can do, we are happy to do it. And like I said, you guys feel free to reach out, shoot me an email if you have any other questions. If I'm not able to answer your questions with specificity, please shoot me an email and we'll set up a time to talk. I think we're about at that point. I, I think I, I have used up all the time <laughs> I've been given, but as grateful as I am for it, thank you so much for everybody logging on and for your engagement in this. So um, I think 
think we're at capacity, but I am available uh, by email if anybody needs anything else from me. Perfect. And then I will be sending out the slides and the video probably early next week for anybody who needs it. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.